Hey everyone, welcome to Strong Mind, Strong Body. I'm your host, Angie Miller, and today we are going to talk about a very unique topic. I don't know about you, but I've been hearing more and more about this topic, so much so that it's what piqued my interest. And it's actually about psychedelics. And specifically, we're going to talk about can psychedelics change the way we age? Because the way I see it is we are an aging society. All of us every day, we're aging. But with the boomers really here, and we are more of an aging society here, especially in the United States, I think that it really invites a lot of talk about aging and how we age positively and how we age well. So studies have shown that psychedelic assisted therapy can decrease anxiety and depression among those who suffer from serious and life-threatening diseases. But for anybody who's facing their mortality, an, an intentional psychedelic experience can potentially shift people from a rigid fear-based place to a place where they are looking at life differently through a different lens, thanks to the experience of psychedelics. And so my guest today is Abby Rosner. She is a freelance writer who explores psychedelic medicine, especially its impact on older adults. And this is, I think, going to be a very enlightening episode for all of us, because no matter how you feel about psychedelics or what you know or what you don't know, I think that knowledge is power and any kind of knowledge helps all of us to really be educated on whatever the situation. And so, Abby, I'm going to bring you in and have you introduce yourself. Thanks how are you so doing, much. Abby? I'm doing great. I'm great. Thanks. Greetings from Philadelphia. All um, right. We're both on the East Coast. On your show. You bet. Yes, we are both on the East Coast. So, Abby, I want to tell everybody how I met you. I actually read one of your articles in MAPS, and I practice as a licensed therapist, and I also work in the health and fitness space. And as a licensed therapist, I subscribe to a lot of different therapeutic uh, sites, um, everything mm -hmm. from internal family systems to acceptance and commitment therapy. And literally within the past six months, every single uh, entity or every single educational body in the world of therapy that I subscribe to has sent information and articles on psychedelic medicine. And it really got me thinking because psychedelic assisted therapy is really making groundbreaking efforts here. And so I really want to bring you in and kind of talk about that. And first, I'm just curious, what, um, what is your background as a journalist or a writer? Well, um, thanks. Thanks, Angie. I've been a writer for many years, a freelance writer, but I'm also a baby boomer. And in the last, I guess, probably about seven, eight years, I've really been interested in the way that the, the drugs of our youth, the recreational, let's say the drugs of our youth are now coming back into our lives as we age and the ways that they can actually uh, improve our quality of life as we as we um, enter this uh, later stage in life. And so it started with cannabis, thinking about how, uh, you know, it could help with our aches and pains and also help us maybe relax instead of alcohol, kind of a healthier way to, to uh, use these substances. But then in, in about 2018, I read Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind about psychedelics. And that was really an eye opener for me. And what particularly caught my attention were the studies about psychedelics with cancer patients and how dramatically these experiences with, uh, with psychedelic assisted therapy could change people's attitudes about death from, you know, from real fear and terror to just this tremendous equanimity. And I thought to myself, God, that is really so impressive. So anyway, that just got me started. And I've been researching and writing about this topic ever since. No, yeah. you know, it's interesting because when you and I spoke, I too read Michael Pollan's book and he also has a show, I believe it's on Netflix and right. it's a fascinating book, a fascinating show. And, and you're right that all the research on end of life and on mortality and serious illness, because you're right, it did start with cannabis for um, pain management and so forth. And so, um, it, 
tell us, you know, speaking of that, I know that everyone goes end of life, what a dreary topic. But at the at, you know, the truth is that we all live on this earth for a period of time, and we all mm -hmm. have a beginning of life and an end of life. Mm -hmm. And we, I guess my thought would be if there is assistance out there to help people fear less about the end of life and, and have more experiences to bring them to a place of calm, then why not? Or why not invite the conversation and the research? So can you tell us a little bit about that research? Because truthfully, you're talking to um, somebody who read and remembers it, but doesn't remember it. So fill me in. Okay, well, first, I think it would probably be, probably be helpful for the listeners to just talk a little bit, a bit about what psychedelics are. And um, so they are a group of drugs that cause very profound changes in your consciousness and your perception. And this, you know, for a period of hours. And in these, in this category of drugs, we have LSD, psilocybin, which is magic mushrooms, the compound of magic mushrooms. Also uh, mescaline, which comes from the peyote cactus, among others. And particularly the plant-based medicines, the, the mushrooms, the, the cactus, these are, are sacred medicines that have been used by indigenous people for, for millennia as part of their ritual practices. And they use them as a way to enter the spirit world and to engage with, with, um, with the others. The, uh, you know, the, they pull back the veil, so to speak. And so, um, in the end of life context, the most commonly used drug is psilocybin, which is, which is as I said, that's the, the uh, compound from mushrooms. Now, the research really started with end of life kind of by accident in the, the early researchers in the 1950s and 60s, they were looking for what to do with these. At the time it was LSD, but they were looking for what do we do with these like very powerful drugs? They knew that they they changed your consciousness in very, very um, pronounced ways, but they didn't really know what it was good for. And there was a doctor in Chicago and he thought, well, you know, I'll, maybe I'll give it to my cancer patients and see if it helps them with their pain. So it actually did help them with their pain. But what it also helped was he found that, you know, surprisingly, they were they were suddenly much more relaxed about their illness. And they, they started, they seemed like they didn't really care so much the, about the fact that they were dying. So this caught the attention of other researchers. And, and uh, so that, that started one line of research. But another line of research, which was also going on, was about the trying to see the connection between these psychedelic, these really profound psychedelic experiences and the, and the spiritual and the religious experience. And there was a researcher in, at Harvard named Walter Pankey, and he did a, a kind of a milestone research study where he took a bunch of divinity students and gave them psilocybin and mm -hmm. on Good Friday in a church. And he wanted to see, are they going to have a mystical religious experience, just like the saints, you know, and the, the people from the, all these religious traditions. And they did, in fact, have these very profound religious mystical experiences. So this same researcher went on, who was also a, a medical doctor, went on to take this psilocybin and give it to cancer patients. In, but in a very, very uh, thoughtful way so that he looked at the, trying to make the set and the setting for the, for the treatment to optimize it so that they would have a profound spiritual experience. And what happened after those studies was that they saw that this was indeed an excellent uh, treatment for anxiety in cancer patients. So... Abby, I, I have to interject here. First of all, this is fascinating. I did not know about the um, researcher at Harvard. I did not know about that. Um, what, what strikes me is that I hear a lot now too about the death positive movement. 
-hmm. And I know that you talk about psychedelics in relation to the death positive movement. And, and I hope that I can do it justice by saying that the way I look at the death positive movement is that death doesn't have to be an experience of pain and regret. Would mm -hmm. if we were able to make it a more positive experience because it is inevitable, right? For all of us mm -hmm. and some of us more quickly than others, those who are mm -hmm. faced with terminal illnesses. And, but one thing I do want to say too, is um, you talk about set and setting. Mm -hmm. And so I told you, I subscribe to all these different sites and these mm -hmm. different bodies of research. And mm -hmm. yesterday I was listening in on one of the psychedelic medicine conferences that is going on right now in Deepak right. Chopra. Am I saying mm -hmm. his name right? I always am not very good at it. Was mm -hmm. speaking and was speaking about psychedelic, the integration of psychedelic medicine and therapy. Mm -hmm. And and just the way I, I could never do justice to all the information that he was putting out there, but some very, mm -hmm. very powerful, powerful leaders, thought leaders, uh, leaders in the mental health space, leaders in health and wellness are talking about this because it does have a place. And so... Mm -hmm just changing consciousness, adding more positive experience to what was once a very fear-based experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so did I do that justice on talking about kind of the death positive movement? Well, I think that, I think that um, the death, I guess the, when we talk about something being death positive, it's a real, sh it's a real shift in the way our, our culture looks at death. You know, we don't, we don't like to talk about death. We don't like to think about death. But uh, one of the things that a psychedelic experience really brings to fore is a, a, an acceptance that uh, that death is is the natural order of things. And and you hear it a lot in the testimonies of, of these cancer patients that have been in these studies. And why don't I just read? Let me just read a quote from one of the a woman who had a wonderful experience, and she said. I was hoping the experience, but this is an, a, a woman, a doctor who was diagnosed with cancer. And she said, I was hoping the experience would help me feel less fearful of dying, but it has given me so much more than that. It has helped me come back to life. I feel more connected to myself, friends, family, and our beautiful, fragile planet. While I've always appreciated spending time in nature, I now see how alive and awe-inspiring the world around us is. Mm -hmm. So it's not only that you you lose what what happens you instead of being focusing on death, you focus on life. It's it's a shift mm -hmm. in your focus from the fear of death to the beauty of life and the miracle of life. And mm -hmm. I think that that's really one of the things that that. Um, that people who have experienced psychedelic assisted therapy talk about. And interestingly, it's also an experience that people who've had near death experiences report the same kind of thing that once they've, they've touched death and in many ways in a psychedelic experience, you are kind of experience. You're, you're having such a shift in conscious that you, your ego dissolves, yes. you lose your sense of self. And when you lose your sense of self, you find that there is actually something that 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 persists that remains yeah and yeah. that's and that's something that's very very profound and spiritual well and just lowering the ego and and putting yourself i i like that i like that it's less about taking away the fear and more about living life today in the present moment and fully experiencing as it is where you are today Absolutely. so abby Let's put yeah. that aside. Let's put mortality aside. And let's just talk about psychedelics and aging because we are an aging society. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I know you do a lot of research and I want to reintroduce you. So my name is Angie Miller. This is Strong Mind, Strong Body. We are talking about can psychedelics change how we age? And my guest today is Abby Rosner. And she is a freelance writer who is focused, a lot of her research is focused on psychedelics and aging and psychedelics and end of life. So, Abby, what about psychedelics and how they relate to the aging process? Okay, well, I, you know, I, I, as you mentioned, I'm a big research geek. I like to read about all the new studies. And uh, something very interesting came out of Johns Hopkins recently 
a researcher found that giving psychedelics actually to mice, um, that they it opens up what's called the uh, the critical period. And this is the time in, let's say, in infants, when the brain is very, very open to learning new experiences, to learning language, and to learning how, to learn how to focus. And this actually happens when you're under the influence of a psychedelic drug. And so what does that mean for older adults? You know, we do get kind of set in our ways. We have very, very... A deeply entrenched tracks of thinking. And a psychedelic experience can really take you out of that and let you see the world in a new light. It lets you um, evaluate things differently. It allows you, in many, many people talk about experiencing a sense of the divine. They feel when as they as as they, their ego diminishes, as we talked about earlier, they find that they are held in something benevolent and loving they feel they sometimes they call it god sometimes they call it an infinite power it's it's you know it's ineffable which is one of the words that that we use to describe a psychedelic experience but it's very very profound and many times people after they have this experience they go back to their normal life a little changed and they feel that they <clears throat> They have a new understanding about what matters. Love comes up a lot. The idea of love and experiencing love and, and expressing love to your family, to, to saying the things that you, you know, that maybe you don't even think to say, and and to appreciating the connections that you have. I've heard many stories of people that have, you know, they they experience forgiveness for or you know wounds that they had in the past, and it, it you know we think about Thich Nhat Hanh. He says you know if we can heal our past, then we can heal our future. So that opportunity to really go back and heal heal the the primal wounds. You know people talk about forgiving their you know the parents that didn't parent them well and the people that hurt them, and and when you come out of that with with that peace, it really can influence the way you live the rest of your life. Um, so I, I tried to take some notes because I was really hanging on your every word here. And some of the things that really came to my mind is initially you were talking about how as we age, we get more rigid in our thought patterns. We get more stuck. We see things this way and we think this is the right way because this is the way that we know, not necessarily because it's the right way. Mm -hmm. And what I really hear you say is that psychedelics open our mind to possibility. We're not so stuck. We're, we're less, you know, the ego is no longer there. And what I, what I equated to is the same thing as when I first learned about meditation and mm -hmm. I took an eight week course through UMass through John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness mm -hmm. and meditation program. And, mm -hmm. and it was all about letting go of the ego and being mm -hmm. into the present moment and leaning into more acceptance of what is not what should be, not mm -hmm. what could be, but what is and just being mm -hmm. fully present. But it is hard. And people say all the time, well, I don't know how to meditate or I'm not good at meditating. Right. And really what they're saying is I can't shut my mind down and I can't mm -hmm. put my ego on a shelf. Mm -hmm. And I think what I hear you say is psychedelic medicine comes in and says, you don't have to worry about that because it's going to take care of that. It's going yeah. to lower the ego in a way mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. invite more peace, invite more get more clarity so that you know what matters and what doesn't old grudges no longer feel so big. And I too have read a lot of the research where it's amazing what people report. And yeah, I, I think it's a fascinating topic and whether people listen to this and think, well, I have strong feelings. I don't think psychedelics belong in our society or whether they listen to it and they think that sounds really amazing. Either way, again, I think knowledge is power and education is something before we all make um, you decide how we feel about something. It does help to have the education at our disposal so that we can make conscious guided decisions. Right, and so, right. Right. Um, right. you know, let's talk about the legality of this. OK, okay. Um, we know I know ketamine um, clinicians could administer ketamine and ketamine mm -hmm. is used a lot for depression. Mm -hmm. I know Dr. Raymond Turpin was on my podcast a few months ago and we did an episode on psychedelic medicine. He talked about MDMA, mm -hmm. which 
the street name is Molly. He talked about mm -hmm. uh, psilocybin, the mushrooms, and he also talked mm -hmm. about ketamine. Mm -hmm. And I know his practice <clears throat> in Asheville administers ketamine, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. is legal. But yeah. I also know that psilocybin is not yet. Can you tell us what that looks like right now? Yeah, sure. Um, psilocybin is still uh, a Schedule One controlled substance, so it means it's federally legal. It's considered the most, uh, you know, dangerous uh, drug of no medicinal uh, utility by the Drug Enforcement Administration. That said, it's also a an experimental drug under the F and the FDA has found such promise in its use for treatment resistant depression and including uh, depression with, with uh, ter the terminally ill that it has given psilocybin breakthrough therapy status. So at the moment it's in phase three studies. Now that said, the only way that you, anyone can access a fully legal experience with psilocybin is by enrolling in a cl clinical trial. Now, in parallel, one can also, if you have plenty of resources, you can go to a, to a, um, a retreat center in Jamaica or in Costa Rica where, well, I don't think in Costa Rica it's legal, but in Jamaica, I know it's, mm -hmm. it's you, or to the Netherlands. There's a couple of places in the, in the world where you can do these experiences legally. But in the meantime, uh, Colorado has recently decriminalized psilocybin. So they have psilocybin service centers where you can go and have a regulated experience with a licensed facilitator. Now, this is a brand new service. It's the first one in the country. It's just opened. Uh, it is will cost uh, probably a couple thousand dollars to have the experience, but there's, I know there's large waiting lines for this kind of experience to mm -hmm. have. In the meantime, Colorado's also decriminalized. There, there are a couple of other uh, states and uh, states that are considering localities that have, have decriminalized psilocybin. That means, what it means is that they've simply made it a very, the lowest priority for law enforcement officials. It's not technically legal but it is decriminalized. So you can have the experience without worrying about getting arrested, but yeah. So well, that's, I, that's the legal status. Okay. Basically. And I really wanted to talk about that because there's something I really want to make sure that we talk about and you touched on it. And I, I want to pick that back up. You talked about set and setting mm -hmm. and in every single lecture, every single article, every body of research set and setting is powerful. I, for one, I, for one, want to go on the record as saying I would not encourage anybody to go out there and go to a retreat in Jamaica or get psilocybin from just whoever, wherever. Set and setting are powerful, especially, in fact, if you're looking for psilocybin as medicinal medicine, if you're looking for it as an opportunity to grow in any way. I would then say look up clinicaltrials.gov and look at see if you can get into a clinical trial or again consider um a provider who is experienced in set and setting because that makes all the difference people can have very negative psychedelic experiences if in fact they don't know what they're doing they're not guided properly things can come up that you're not prepared to deal with or that that person is not prepared to deal with and that's why set and setting matter and so to me safety comes first i think it's powerful to know the research know the information be mm -hmm. educated but safety first and i for one am you know kind of out there going hold on you know let's put the brakes on before we put the accelerate on accelerator on know the education know the information make a conscious decision but really talk to somebody who influ who is focused on set and setting who is who has more than one provider in the room who is experienced in helping you so that whatever comes up you have a safe space and place to talk mm -hmm. about that with a person who is equipped to talk about that. The main thing is, Abby, I really appreciate you coming on and just talking about the impact of psychedelics on aging and the impact of psychedelics on those who are facing terminal illness or 
Um, because I do think that it's important to, to learn about the research, understand the impact of psychedelic medicine and mm -hmm. how it does have that influence on the brain, especially as we age and how it can really open up or invite less fear and open up more uh, thinking patterns that maybe we can't get to when the ego gets involved. But I really appreciate all of you strong mind, strong body listeners. I appreciate you, Abby Rosner, for coming on and sharing your research. Again, I appreciate your work in maps and all the information that you've provided. Thanks to all of our strong mind, strong body listeners, and we'll see you next week.